so the uh, online participants can uh, see the screen right and can hear to listen to us right so uh, yes yes sir okay thank you thank you mr alam for the confirmation right so as discussed uh, we um, after this uh, session what we discussed before the tea break uh, we are now going to have a short demo uh, because we have to make this demo short the time is uh, uh, not permitting us um, there has been a delay in the tea break so anyway we are we are going to present our tool uh, links uh, we call it links it's uh, um, uh, it's a gnpi based optical network planning tool and um, uh, will be a bit quick okay so just what what we what we would like to show to you guys is that uh, the effort being made by students of seeks and saad is here uh, mohammad saad raza our software engineering uh, student um not student anymore a graduate in fact sorry 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 to call you that <laughs> uh, our our software engineering graduate uh, he graduated this year right and it was uh, this is his fyp effort final year project effort right so um saad um and his team members ali tamur and samu sami mansur alvi and i was their fyp advisor okay so we have developed this uh, this tool called links and i hope you guys will like it we we just gave a presentation to the telecom infra project of facebook and they they absolutely loved it so we, the links is being hosted live at this website and it's available i'll share the link on uh, of uh, this link uh, on chat with you guys and before going to the demo just um, because time is quite short and we actually wanted to show links to you guys to in uh, in uh, in some detail because it's uh, uh we believe that it's quite some effort from our side so <laughs> you know praising uh, own self is not good but <laughs> um i'm praising sad and his team their team so i'll skip the problem statement and the uh, part where we discuss why network planning is important we just uh, had a session uh let me just go to the functionality and features of uh, links and uh, i'll hand it over to you sad if you want to uh, discuss the functionalities of the tool uh, what it can do Yeah. Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Saad. So, uh talking about the functionality of links, uh, uh the main uh, inspiration for us to was to build a tool that creates Sorry, to close, to close to the mic there are okay. 19 20 people. Yeah. Okay. So, our inspiration with this uh, tool was to uh, create an ease of use for network operators to be able to design their networks. So, uh talking about the functionality, we have custom topology generation we have a map on which the user can uh, select uh, cities on which he can place nodes and specify fiber connections between them uh, next we have adjacency and traffic matrices to specify fiber connections between nodes and to specify traffic requests uh, between uh, nodes uh, the multi vendor support is a feature that uh, has been possible through the use of gnpi what it means is ke uh you can uh, the operator can specify custom uh, network elements which he can use in his uh, topology generation uh we also have the support for a fault tolerant routing which is very important in network planning uh the auto design network topology feature uh, uh optimizes your specified network topology it calculates the optimum amplifier placement and it decides how uh, to split up fiber uh, fiber into multiple spans uh in the end we have the routing and spectrum assignment which uh calculates how your optical signals will travel throughout the entire network uh the impact of this project sad i think uh, the demo is very important uh, yeah, so we should. we should skip this uh, if you just want to tell them about uh, Um, the architecture the architecture of the tool yeah. yeah so the tool has been developed as a, a service product uh we have a front end uh, repository which uh, uh, is run on the browser we also have a back end which uh, is written in node js and uh, it uh, creates bindings uh, that allows us to use the software development kit of gnpi so on the front end uh, the front end has been built with angular the style components have been used are prime ng and for the map we use the mapbox api an important thing to note here is the type system uh, for gnpi which you see on the front end so this is a implementation of our own what it does is it allows us to uh, serialize and deserialize information so that it is compatible for the format that is been used by gnpi 
and uh, just to let the audience know because uh, i mean when we were presenting in front of facebook they knew gnpy in some detail yeah uh, but uh, gnpy is what uh, jan kundrat from cessnet was uh, referring to in his yesterday's talk so jan gave a talk yesterday here and yeah. uh, uh, he is the custodian of the gnpy yeah. library right now yeah. so gnpy gnpy is uh, the uh, gaussian noise uh, library in Py written in python by the by the consortium of physical simulation environment uh under the telecom infra project led by facebook and it's uh, the accurate physical layer simulation uh, library which uh, does the optical layer design uh with uh, with with the help of gn model so on top of that we have built our tool links so so underlying links uh, is yeah. is the accurate design of uh, provided by the tip project gn pi library okay yeah. so i don't know if we can uh, yeah, that's yeah, that's the complex class diagram yeah. let's skip that as well that yeah, what what you guys have done something. yeah uh, let's go directly to the live link and yeah. uh, show them sure. show them some demo so uh, you should do it no sir you can do it yeah. okay so um, uh, let me see just see the chat message uh, yeah but, uh, okay so we didn't uh, move to presentation mode because um, okay so the reason was that uh, we we didn't have time to go through and we believe that the demo is more important so now we have 20 minutes to show our tool to you guys so i mean uh, before coming here the first screen that you will encounter when you will write the the url will be this one yeah okay. you should take it yeah, you, okay. deserve, you deserve it <laughs> yeah that's your tool okay uh so please. okay so the first time you use this link you're going to be redirected to a login page uh, anyone who has a Google account can uh, use the application. Uh, you just have to sign in through your Google account. Uh, we have signed in uh, already over here. Uh, so I should just take you to the flow. Uh, so yeah. after you've logged in, you'll be redirected to this project page. Uh, you can uh, select your previous created projects or if you're new, you can just create a project. I'm just going to uh, create a project right now. Mm -hmm. And it's going to take us to the main uh, dashboard. So we have a map here. Uh, we have the top panel bar, which has different options. We also have the left panel bar. Uh, the maps used have been API. On the bottom right, you'll see uh, information that you can abstract to make your viewing easier. So I think we should go ahead with the, a custom or we should load in yeah we, we can just show them how custom topology can be created just yeah. by adding or dropping to one or two nodes yeah and then we can go to the already created topology yeah. okay so to create a node i'm going to just go to this um, let's uh, take an example of uh, one of our let's say uh, participants let's write bangladesh here. okay okay so we are going to create a custom topology let's say Same. you write uh, dhaka okay add node so it's going to take us over there yes. and okay notice. let's try it uh, i don't know chittagong okay and a third one as well uh, i don't know probably khulna. khulna yeah okay okay so we have right. three nodes right now so uh, i mean what we need to do is now specify fiber connections between them yeah. we can go to this matrix which has the adjacency matrix you'll see uh, it's an n by n matrix of all the nodes i can specify a connection between them for now i'm just going to use the default uh, configurations specify some more connections Okay, so now we have three nodes and we have connections between them. We can view the information of uh, our fibers. Uh, as I just mentioned, I just use the default. If you want, you can specify more parameters over here, uh, which will be particular to that fiber. So now what we're going to do is uh, we're going for the auto design. What it's going to do, it's going to calculate uh, amplify placement optimum and it's going to split up the fiber into multiple fan spans. So you can see over here, you can hover 
uh, over the nodes and you'll see the information. Same with amplifiers. These are the amplifier sites. Yeah. They have the gain target and every information that you need. Yeah. So uh, next uh, we should go for the spectrum assignment. For that, we need to first specify uh, some traffics. Suppose I want traffic to go from uh, Dhaka to Khulna. So I'm just going to specify bandwidth of 100 gigabits. Okay, so the transceiver is Voyager, the spacing 40 gigahertz, max channels allowed. So specify one more. Right. Yeah. Also 100 gigabits over here. Okay. So as you'll see, the purple links over here, they specify the logical traffic links. Uh, in this case, it's just straight lines because it isn't uh, a very complex topology. Nice. So now we're going to uh, calculate the spectrum assignment. Okay, so the result from Dhaka to Khulna, it is marked by the green path. Uh, and you can see the metrics that have been calculated. Uh, we have uh, the frequency spectrum, if you'll see at the bottom, a 191.29 terahertz of frequency to 191.35 terahertz frequency. Yeah. That's the spectrum in which this yes. uh, optical signal is traveling on that fiber. And because it's a twice scenario of three nodes, so you, you see the paths are quite simple. They're pretty much. Yeah. But as the topology uh, yeah. grows, uh, you'll see that uh, multiple uh, signals are traveling on the same fiber and you can see them and the computed results. So for a more detailed yeah. view of uh, everything, every uh, element that is involved in that path, you can go over here. So yeah, that's basically how you create a custom create topology. a custom topology. Yeah. So, and then yeah, let's uh, let's show them uh, uh, you know uh, uh, an already created topology. So yeah, uh, links which you can is, load. Yeah, which yeah. we which we don't have to create. This this was how you can create your own custom topology. Yeah. So you can just write the name of uh, uh, country and city, and then add links. Uh, and then uh, links is uh, picking up uh, uh, topologies available in the internet topology zoo. Yeah, uh, some, from the API. From the API, something wonderful that you guys have found because this mm -hmm. zoo is actually a zoo. It's full of topologies. I don't know yeah. how you find it. <laughs> anyway, so interestingly, um, we there is a fern topology also available in that zoo. So let's uh, let's uh, see fern two. Probably it's a, a bit old one, not not a new one, but it's right here. So again, you can do all those things that you know. Auto, you, if you auto design topology, it will uh, put the uh, amplifier placements uh, on uh, on fern topology. And when when uh, when we click on auto design topology, what links do actually is that it goes to uh, our backend and it backend. computes the results yes. using GNPy and then it yes. sends it back. So uh, th this amplifier placement is actually computed by GNPy, not not links. So underlying links is the GNPy by the Telecom Infra project uh, led by Facebook. So the design shown here is, uh, we can say with the, a certainty of 99.999% that it is quite accurate, okay? And uh, you can uh, just uh, use it right away. So for example, um, I think we, uh, I don't know, um, but we have some other topologies, for example, CERNET. I don't know if a member of CERNET is right now uh, present in the audience. So you can see right here. It's quite a big topology. China is a is a is a big country, so CERNET topology is right here. So if you want to you know, do the auto design, <clears throat> this is the Chinese Research and Education Network. So taking more time because you yeah, see it's, it's complex. quite quite complex topology, and you see there are so so many amplifier sites because these links are also quite of I think quite quite a large distances. I believe uh, you know there are hundreds of kilometers of links uh, and probably some of uh, uh, thousands or more. Um, and then obviously, if you if you go to the matrix panel, you will see a much, much larger uh, physical topology view over here. And you can just, um, you can see that uh, which connections are currently in use. Okay, for yeah. example, over here, Beijing is connected with the which nodes. So you can just scroll it, uh, you know, you have to, 
you have to keep going yeah. in the second pan and third pan because it's see. so big you it's have so to big, extract yeah. some of the information yeah so guan guangzhou uh, beijing is connected to guangzhou actually and uh, no i'm Hai wrong Kuchan. i'm wrong actually Hai Kuchan. Hai Kuchan. but uh, yeah. anyway so the point is that uh, this is how i think it's quite a big example to give <laughs> and then the traffic matrix is right here so you can specify traffic is and then after doing that you can do the spectrum assignment okay so uh, uh this is pretty much it obviously uh, the use demo case. yeah uh you want to again the, you, the use case okay yeah. let, let me do that you can tell them case. yeah sure yeah. uh but for that uh, let's take a oh, you we do it here let's take a more uh, let's take a giant uh, topology it's a slightly uh, okay. dispersed in a sense because the uh, the cernet topology was uh, more towards the towards the eastern part where most of the population of china lies so that's why it was difficult to de depict use case over there here we can easily depict the use case so if we again do the auto design so it goes to gnpy at the back end talks to gnpy right uh, and gnpy gives the give the physical layer design which is being displayed by links over here and then um, uh, let's uh, let's say that um, uh now oh, i always forgot how to create the use case um i mean um uh, yeah. it, it's always a new example can, that i take uh, so let's go to the create nodes and add new nodes uh, yeah uh instead of that i can just create a new path but a before connection. that well yeah a connection but before that let me just uh let me just add traffic between barcelona and naples okay so barcelona and naples okay so barcelona and uh, a traffic or a connection no a traffic and then okay. uh, and then after adding the connection i'll show them yeah. how links can dynamically help you um, assess test. your topology yeah. test your topology so that could be a very good use case yeah. so you should use it <laughs> barcelona add traffic between barcelona and naples because naples should be oh, okay so there is a feature of extending it i don't know Is that fine, no, but you should go to the first uh, one because Barcelona was right there. Then you have to scroll over this direction to find Naples no, because I you cannot see the nodes over here. No, uh, Barcelona is here, so I have to find the okay. row in which okay. uh, Naples is. And uh, isn't show sure what it is Rome? Yeah, the node is Rome. Oh, okay. not Naples. So sorry. Yeah, uh, the pizza, so that's from, why pizza, find pizza from Naples is very famous. So maybe that's why I, I was recalling Naples instead of Rome. Yeah, the node is Rome. Yeah. Okay. So add a traffic between Rome and Barcelona. Yeah. yeah. Over here. Okay. Just add something. Uh, it's yeah. okay. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. The default. Mm -hmm. And then let's do the spectrum assignment. That's the logical link, okay? There is yeah. obviously, uh, we just discussed in my session that that's not the link that actually existed. Uh, so that's how the upper layer is visualizing their topology. But when we do the spectrum assignment, that's the RSA process. You see that uh, okay, so there's a green path right the here. Green path here. Okay. That's how traffic is going from Barcelona to yeah. Rome. But now we cannot actually depict the, the actual, uh, you know, uh, uh, beauty of links, but with just one example, we can try to depict you that how easy it is for the operators to do planning over here. So, for example, now if we add a link between Rome and Barcelona, so it's this is what you are doing with your network in front of you, just simply on desktop, and then you you can just see. I mean, uh, because when you generally do uh, have some new requirements, you are uh, dependent the the operators are dependent on the vendors to to bring solutions to their tables and they do not have any uh, concrete measures to uh, to check and observe if the solution provided by by the vendors are uh, are correct or not okay so by this kind of a planning tool in their hand the operators will have the power to bargain with the vendors and they will have the power to to check whether the solutions provided by the vendor are actually accurate and the ones that uh, uh, that they should uh, go ahead or not. You see, 
so it you just made a dynamic the tool is so easy to use that you are just made you just made a dynamic change let's say you uh, now we we created a small use case but let's say you you had the entire traffic matrix and you had congestion in some links what you can do is that you can just add new nodes or just add new links and you can see what effect it will bring on your topology okay well, it seems simple in 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 the front uh, when we we are showing it to you but at the back end we can also showcase fault tolerant paths we can yeah so but we should leave some time for the question answers as well yeah and just so we're just going to enable this path yeah. to be a fault tolerant and okay. it's going to compute uh, another fault tolerant path to go with it so let's do the auto design once again and the spectrum assignment so now you see here the blue path is going to be the fault tolerant path which is going to be reserved uh, if uh, in a situation in which the primary path uh, is blocked or isn't responding uh, and by the way the blue path was the one which used to be the real path when we did not edit this this yeah. this link right here and in that case, the fault tolerant path would have been some some other path, not other than the blue path. But anyway, so I think we we have to. There were there are still a lot of things uh, that can be shown. But uh, at twelve, we have a talk uh, by Professor Filippo Cugini, so we should leave five minutes for the Q A session. So, uh, if audience sitting in front of us or uh, online, if you have anything, any question to ask from this tool, uh, please go ahead. Fault tolerance path basically calculated on the basis of number of nodes or counts the mm, path which have basically yeah i mean after the shortest part the second shortest part second. is the, the fault tolerance path calculated on the basis of hope count. hope count yes but this should not be there should not be any overlapping fiber links uh in in, in those two paths it does not calculate the bandwidth of the fiber links the fiber links which have more bandwidth it should be preferred as compared to the that 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 is a metric you can uh, you can um, you can do routing by using that but right now it is doing the hope count but obviously you have to select one metric okay what is the maximum length between two amplifiers uh, the amplifier placement is done entirely by gnpy so under underneath links is the gnpy um, library uh, again as i mentioned uh, uh, built by the by the consortium of TIP and uh, uh, physical uh, the the subgroup of physical simulation environment in the consortium of TIP led by Facebook and that is the same library that Jan Kondrat from Cessnet was mentioning yesterday. So it's a it's a Gaussian noise model uh, for uh, for the for the physical layer. Uh, typically, it is 80 kilometer. Yes, yes. Typically, it is 80 kilometer, but uh, uh, right here, uh, if we uh, have a span, length. we have a span, length, right? Yeah, we have, we have we, it is also 80 in our case. No, I think it's 150 right now. No, it's too high, it cannot be 150. No, the default, uh, uh, yeah, the default configuration which GNPy comes with, it has a 150 setting as that, that that is coming from GNPy. Yeah, that's too high. The default configuration. So, if you want, we can just but anyway, it's still our tool give you the yeah. ability Customer. to just yeah. use. I mean, do do it on your own as as you say. So it's a yes. Yeah, so no. Your entire network is in front of you on desktop, and you can just uh, you know change configurations, change any any parameter, and just click once again, and you will see the new design coming right up. Okay. So yeah, it's so it's fun. It's uh, so now it's, hello, 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 sir. If we want to install a new node between existing two nodes, what is the procedure? Yeah, you can just uh, so just add a node, sir. So in add this, a node. yeah, uh, add a Turin. node, let's say, Turin. yeah, Turin, my second hometown, sure, uh, why not? Uh, Italy. Italy, Italy, and then I don't know, it should be Torino here. Oh, it's Turin, okay, so English. Yeah, you just do that. You add a new node, and then you okay. have to specify, specify connections. The connections yeah. uh, between Turin and uh, yeah, Turin Milan. Now. Sure, Turin Milan. So just find Turin. 
and just you. I mean, it's specifying connection, uh, Mr. Alam is uh, pretty much the same. Like you just go and uh, just tick box, and the connection will be specified, just like that. Okay. So it's it's. So yeah. Yeah, that's it. You're good to that's go. The there is it. There it is. I mean, I really uh, find it fun to play with the network and. Uh, so this uh, is a pretty fun tool. I, I even gave, uh, it can be served as an educational tool as well. I even gave an assignment to, when I was teaching for the course of photonic networks and the students, the master students, they really enjoyed doing the assignment on this course. So, okay. Um, oh, could you please show learn network? Uh, I, we are not sure that if learn network is, uh, is available in the topology zoo. Let's just check if it is available or not. I am so sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Learn network is not available in the topology zoo. Uh, if we write, write Sri Lanka, no, no, it's not. So sorry, uh, but we are picking topology, but you can create your own. You can from create your own, I mean, from a, yeah. So, and then Professor Kujini has joined. Thank you so much for joining in. And uh, he is uh, saying, uh, his, uh, his comment is very good work. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much. Just one question, do you rely on a specific database technology? Now, this is something for you to take. Yeah, the database we use to store topologies, uh, the information for projects is a NoSQL database, which is Firebase. Uh, I'm sure you would have seen that in the uh, architecture diagram. So the database here used is Firebase, a NoSQL database, uh, objects to store information. Yeah, so this is the architecture diagram, uh, Professor Kujini right here. Uh, yeah. and uh, the database on the, top, uh, on the top, yeah. So I can also mention the database, which is Redis. Redis is a very fast uh, cache database that we use to handle background jobs. So since these optical network uh, computations are really uh, resource intensive, yeah. so uh, what we do is we create background jobs for them and they are handled. And when those jobs are complete, the results are returned to the front end. So this allows us to be able to uh, carry out computations for multiple users at a single time. So that's a scalability. Yeah, and Professor Kujini, this is the TypeScript uh, that uh, uh, our team has written uh, for, for, you know, uh, working with GN5. Working with GN5. So yeah. this, by using this links actually talks to GN5. Right, so um, that's it. Uh, 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 we had to wrap it, wrap it up quickly, but the good thing is that this is the URL and it's available. So I would uh, really like you to check it out in your own time. It's publicly available for free right now. And uh, you just need to have a Google account. You just need to have a Google account, yes. So let's send it to everyone. Let's remove the dashboard. Yeah, I, I'm going to do that. So please check it out. And uh, thank you so much. If there is any other question, please let us know, or you can uh, write to us for the coordinate. Yeah, yeah, the coordinate. Yes, you can write to us oh, here, okay? If you have any comment, suggestion, any anything, feedback. yeah, any feedback, you can write to us over here. And you can check us, check the GitHub library as well, where we have maintained our repository. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So. Right, so this is it. Um, links from School of Electric Engineering and Computer Science, Saad and his team. And uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Saad, thank you for joining. Yeah. Please. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. So let's move ahead uh, to, uh, to our, okay, let's just uh, give me a minute. And uh, okay, so let me just double check once again. Yes, it is recording. And uh, Professor Kujini, I have made you the hello, yeah, okay, so um. Yeah, so first of all, uh, thank you so much, Professor Kujini, for, for joining us today. 
thank you very much for agreeing to uh, you know to our invite and uh, this uh, uh, this invited talk in the software defined optical network training uh, organized uh, by the school of electrical engineering and computer science so professor filippo kizini is associated with cnit pisa italy and um, uh, he is currently the head of research area with cnit pisa italy he is the co author of 14 patents and more than 250 international publications his main research interests include theoretical and experimental studies in the field of communication and networking. So thank you once again very much for joining us today. And um, without further ado, I will hand it over to you. Uh, please, Professor, go ahead. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation and congratulations for the very interesting work you are doing with the Lynx project. Very, very nice. Um, <clears throat> okay, so today, uh, thanks for the invitation. I'm going to uh, talk about uh, disaggregation in optical network, uh, providing an overview of uh, some of the research activities that we are doing in this field, as well as uh, uh, of some maybe uh, comments or suggestions about uh, open issues and, uh, and uh, activities that can be uh, carried out in this field. And then I will uh, move to the latest activities in which we are working on, in which we are active uh, to refer to the uh, evolutions from uh, transponders uh, as standalone elements uh, to support the packet optical white box, uh, which includes uh, pluggable modules uh, as, also, uh, as well as uh, uh, packet programmability. And in particular, we are focusing on the uh, P4 technology to program the, the, the network. So I will give you just at the end uh, some uh, uh, suggestions or, or, or uh, points uh, for, uh, for discussion about uh, the opportunities that uh, this uh, uh, programmable packet optical box may, may open. So let me uh, start by uh, introducing the uh, clarifying the concept of partial disaggregation. So in partial disaggregation, uh, we have transponders uh, that uh, may be operated by multiple vendors here. Uh, let me take the, yeah, this one. We may have uh, transponders operated by different vendors, uh, but the, opt uh, the optical line system is operated just by a single vendor, which is in charge also of the control of the entire network. So in this scenario called partial disaggregation, so the disaggregation actually applies only to transponders. Uh, this, uh, is particular, this scenario is particularly relevant for data center to data center communication. Um, it was basically introduced by, by Google for their uh, scenario, and, uh, but is now gaining consensus because uh, in the, the operators, the optical line system is um, relatively stable as a technology, uh, and uh, while the transponders are exchanged, are, are uh, replaced much more frequently. So, um, avoiding a vendor lock-in in the transponders uh, helps the operator to save uh, uh, capex and also the fact that they can be operated under a standard interface, here these red lines, also uh, simplifies the management of the network. Uh, the, the thing to be clarified is that this controller from vendor A needs to be responsible also for the network. So here we need to have uh, um, a very reliable interoperability and, uh, and also standardized control. Um, the, the advantage of this model is that it is relatively simple, uh, at least the way uh, Google uh, started thinking about it and the way the, rel the related model, which is named OpenConfig, has been, has been designed. For example, uh, they decided to do not specify all the possible transmission parameters, uh, the type of modulation formats for their correction and so on, but they just uh, define the concept of uh, uh, operational mode. So each vendor can even provide its proprietary uh, operational mode, uh, which will have just an ID, and then the connection between transponder B and transponder B from the same vendor can be activated without saying knowing the details of the uh, all the details of the transponder. Of course, some needed to be. Uh, clarified like the wavelength and the power, but the, the specific type of modulation format, for example, is not needed. 
Um, so <clears throat> this simplifies the management of the procedure, but uh, um, and and also the uh, evolution of the technology. You don't need to define continuously new techniques. Uh, uh, you just define a new operational mode. <clears throat> the other uh, scheme that is used for disaggregation is the so-called full disaggregation. In full disaggregation, as you can see, we can also support uh, rodents from different vendors. And uh, here we need an SDN controller that needed to be in charge of all these uh, rodents and transponders from different vendors. So it could be even from a, another uh, vendor as well. This is uh, uh, an initiative that is led by AT&T in the US, and um, it's, uh, it's, it has been specifically designed for metro networks. Uh, <clears throat> so the, the idea here is that the vendors are, uh, uh, the, the lock-in does not only, uh, is not only uh, free in terms of transponders, but also for the vendors, for the rodents. Um, the model here is necessarily more complex. So you need to define everything from the data plane up to the control plane. So it's um, uh, really a multi-source agreement. And, uh, and so here we have to uh, address a lot of uh, issues related to the transmission performance, which of course cannot be really optimized because you cannot really uh, know all the details and uh, being able to handle all the details like proprietary transmission modules. So here we, the, the, the agreement for at and is to standardize everything related to the transmission aspects in such a way that they can control in a careful way all the network um, provisioning and, and, uh, and uh, operations. So where we are at the moment with the disaggregation, I like this drawing from, from Facebook in which uh, it showed that uh, um, disaggregation started in the computing part, moved to the storage, and then was applied to the networking part, particularly in the data center, and now has reached the optical, um, uh, the, the optical uh, uh, scenario. As you can see here, uh, it's uh, a wave that might, might not be easy to stop. So we are somewhere here in the middle, and, uh, but it, we, we expect that, that this, uh, this interest around the, uh, the, the disaggregation will continue, although, say, the market is much smaller than com compared to the other, um, like computing or, or storage or networking in general. Um, so, the, um, what, what is the uh, first comparison that we can do between uh, partial disaggregation and full disaggregation? Um, as of today, uh, partial disaggregation uh, assumes that uh, the optical line system is uh, quite stable. And this is uh, relatively true uh, because it's a more mature technology. Once, once it is deployed, it can stay there for many years without relevant updates. Um, also managing the analog part of the transmission is a little bit more complex. So having it uh, under the control of a single vendor, which is also the one that provides the transport infrastructure is typically convenient. So as of today, um, the, the uh, the evolution is uh, is driving uh, full dis is is uh, uh, the operators at least here in Europe are considering uh, partial disaggregation as the strategy uh, to be implemented uh, as as a first step. Um, the the typical deployment scenario um, here in Europe is that uh, uh, they will open to two as a first step two vendors. Uh, so one vendor in charge of the optical line system and providing at the beginning something like uh, 80, 70 percent of the transponders, but opening for uh, leaving the remaining 20, 30 percent uh, to a second operator to a second vendor of transponders. But then the advantage will be that in the in the following years, um, 
these two uh, vendors will have to compete to provide the new transponders and new solutions. So uh, there will be no more vendor lock-in and possibly a third vendor could even jump in. So uh, this is the current scenario for the deployment of disaggregation, which is taking place. Um, the responsibility in this remains in charge of the main vendor providing the optical line system. And so the uh, one of the typical questions related to disaggregation is that uh, if the uh, telecom operator need to have a strong uh, um, knowledge about how to manage the network in the detail, uh, in a detailed view, this is kind of relaxed because you, you, you still rely on the vendor that is providing the optical line system and, the, and the, the large majority of the transponders. Full disaggregation so appears as at least as something uh, that is less, less practical and uh, maybe more in the long term. Um, even if maybe also in the long term it might not be uh, so convenient, at least for operators that are not uh, extremely uh, big. Um, uh, however, uh, the, the initiative, uh, the Open Road initiative, has been uh, already extremely successful in standardizing uh, transponder solution, like, like, for example, the next generation, plug, the, the, the current generation of pluggable coherent modules. So the Open Rodem MSA has been already very successful for standardizing solution. Um, in order to implement a uh, disaggregated uh, optical network, uh, we needed to have uh, common vendor neutral young models, and we need to have a standard way to communicate to the uh, between the, the controller and the node. And the, the, the de facto standard is NetConf. Uh, now we need to, uh, the, there is a huge interest to support telemetry, so to provide the fine grain granularity or information for, for the management of, of the optical network or running the optical network. In terms of vendor neutral young models, uh, unfortunately, we we see the three different uh, standardization bodies involved, uh, Open Config, Open Roadmap, and IETF. So this doesn't really help because the, the vendors need uh, some operators selected Open Config, others selected Open Roadmap, other IETF. So uh, vendors are, are, are uh, maybe, um, it's, it's, they, are need, they need to implement multiple models which have a different architecture. So this unfortunately is not very convenient and is uh, uh, slowing the, the adoption of, uh, of uh, disaggregation. Uh, we also need to have SDN controllers uh, that need to be able to communicate uh, in a standard way and support uh, uh, devices from different vendors. And also, of course, the, the, the rodems and the transponders need to be uh, updated with uh, this standard uh, agent. So <clears throat> as, I, as I, just to give a brief overview of this, uh, of this technology, uh, we have seen a large consensus around Yang and, and NetConf. As anticipated, Yang uh, is, is not a unique uh, uh, there, there is no a unique uh, young model uh, family, at least that is uh, is considered. Um, NetConf has instead emerged as the unique protocol adopted for the control of the devices. Actually, uh, is not really the most efficient solution because it's uh, it was designed many years ago, and, um, and and maybe it's not super efficient, but. <clears throat> at least is, is the de facto standard. So no real need to, to modify it and to, to change it, just to, to let you know that alternative solutions like based on GNMI are more efficient, more modern technologies, but <clears throat> maybe there's no real, there are other priorities uh, compared to replace NetConf in the, uh, to, to provide a more efficient uh, disaggregated network. In terms of SDN controllers, um, at the moment, uh, the, 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 there are a couple of relevant uh, open source initiatives, uh, but uh, most of these uh, um, operations are rely on proprietary controllers. Uh, the two uh, open source initiatives are Open Daylight and Onos. 
uh, they were both created around the 2013, 2014. And I have to say that uh, uh, they um, have not been, say, fully deployed and are not really uh, ready for deployment. Uh, they are maintained by, respectively, Linux Foundation and ONF. And um, the first one was the basis for some SDN proprietary SDN controller. The second one is widely adopted in, in research projects by the academia, for example, or some controllers. But um, the, the problem is that they are both uh, not really mature enough or complete enough, at least is in, in my opinion. And, and so they are not really ready for pre-production. Uh, uh, even for a pre-production network. And I think the reason behind, and in addition, there are say relevant scalability performance so, uh, issues. So uh, the, the reasons, in my opinion, is that the, um, the operators tend to rely on, at the end, on commercial solutions. So there is no real um, effort that is dedicated to the development or the advancement of these two the solutions, uh, ONOS or Open Daylight. And, and that there is a limited community that is uh, developing uh, and is uh, uh, working on the uh, improvement of these two technologies. Um, and also, uh, the, re the way they were, de they were designed was a little bit, uh, say, old style uh, uh, programming. So a sort of monolithic uh, uh, approach, which, uh, uh, for example, is difficult to, to adapt to some of the uh, technologies that are in the core of ONUS. For example, ONUS still doesn't support flexible grid, for example, as, as a native implementation. And changing it is, is not, say, so easy. It takes uh, time to understand the, the, the core of the, of the technology. Um, so I, um, I see that uh, we may have uh, some uh, evolution here in the SDN controller and maybe links uh, can uh, help in this, uh, uh, in this path. Uh, we, um, as, as a research activities in, uh, here in PISA, we developed, we contributed to the development of some uh, honest solution. Uh, for example, supporting drivers, supporting um, some uh, uh, open config uh, solutions. Uh, we released several patches. We applied ONOS uh, in a set of uh, uh, deployments, uh, including, for example, um, scenarios in which we combined the uh, control of the optical network with the control of uh, packet network, uh, the, the, the client side, basically, of the uh, of the optical network, in this case with uh, OpenFlow, and uh, we also use the different technologies as I will show you later, like for example, P4. So <laughs> as I was saying, one of the possible research activities that could uh, lead to a better solution could be the next gen a next generation SDN controller, something that uh, maybe redesign or maybe take advantage of something provided by ONOS or Open Daylight, but uh, maybe in a more modular way uh, is something that can uh, better address the scalability issues that they, they provide. And, um, and maybe a possible way would be to decouple uh, the, the to, to enable the various component of the SDN controller to be directly accessible by uh, different modules. Uh, the, the question I made before on links on the database technology is that uh, if the database technology of a controller is directly um, accessible by other uh, in a controlled way by other elements uh, and the, the information in the database are stored with the com compliant with the young data model uh, this database uh, could, could serve uh, a tool a provisioning tool like links but could also serve um, an element that deploys the network it could serve uh, the um, uh, other elements for management. So we could have a sort of modular approach, which might, might be much more scalable than the current SDN solutions. Just to say a topic open for research and discussion. In terms of uh, open config and open roadmap agent, um, here we uh, 
develop the, an open source solution uh, which uh, has a netconf agent based on the confd uh, tool uh, which uh, relies on a python driver for uh, controlling the underlying hardware and also includes the possibility to rely on the grpc telemetry server uh, we have uh, installed, we, we, we have deployed it uh, to control a uh, uh, fully disaggregated roadmap in, in which uh, he, in this case, fully disaggregated, fully disaggregation uh, applies even to the single components. Um, so here we, we worked on a standardized version of the control interface to control the, the WSSs, the, the amp the, the uh, EDFAs, so all the parameters that are within, uh, for example, a roadmap. The goal here is not really to support operators' uh, activities because they will just see the roadmap as a single box, but to, to help in the standardization of the, the way these roadmaps are built, so to simplify the vendor implementation but this is something that will may happen later on and 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 they still say a further level of disaggregation that is not mature yet we also implemented some uh, local algorithms uh, to uh, and finite state machine to control the operations of the of the node and we also introduced some local machine learning tools to uh, evaluate the monitoring parameters uh, we also investigated the responsibility management when we are in a, a disaggregated network, because you may consider that uh, um, the responsibility, particularly in the case of a full disaggregation, is uh, something that is extremely relevant for the operators. And so uh, we investigated the blockchain technology uh, and, the, and the solutions that uh, are nowadays uh, available, uh, open source, uh, related to the blockchain. And this was applied, for example, to guarantee that uh, uh, the, the decisions and the actions taken by a node and by the controller are stored in a, in a blockchain. And so we have uh, the validation and, uh, and the logging basically is uh, uh, done in a reliable way. And this applies also when different controllers can uh, uh, interoperate uh, for uh, some multi-domain connection or even between the software and the hardware with a local uh, lightweight agent uh, because you may have also a disaggregation in the box between the software agent and the, uh, the operating system of the, of the node or the transponders and the underlying hardware. So if responsibility management is an issue for the operators, nowadays there are solutions based on blockchain that can guarantee uh, the, the, uh, to, to identify who is the responsible for a possible failure or a possible issue. We also, uh, leveraging on the collaboration with the colleagues here, we also applied uh, our uh, software control to photonic integrated devices. And uh, the nice thing is that uh, uh, thanks to this uh, standard way to control uh, the uh, the, the, the network elements, it's very uh, easy to add a new technology in the deploy a new technology because you can just uh, uh, replace the underlying um, driver that connects the agent to the, to the hardware, so the proprietary uh, way of configuring the hardware and all the rest uh, remain stable. And so it's very, uh, say, easy to introduce new technologies here. And, uh, and so, for example, here we investigated the use of a uh, uh, roadmap based on, uh, uh, on, on micro rings and, um, and, and, and we control them with uh, uh, our uh, ONUS controller and the SDN agent. <clears throat> so okay, this uh, this is uh, basically to to recap about uh, the the main uh, the main issues related to uh, the disaggregation. So uh, as as I anticipated, open config uh, represents nowadays the most interesting uh, uh, and, and the most practical solution for the operators in Europe. There is. Uh, um, uh, 
uh, however, the, the work here is not progressing super fast. And one of the reasons is that there are different standardization bodies involved. Uh, and uh, however, say this clear separation between hardware and software is, on the other hand, is helping to progress. And, and also, uh, it, it might be possible that new players would, would jump in to, to provide the SDN solution. So we, in particular, this happens in the packet optical box that I'm going to discuss uh, soon. Okay, so now I'm going to uh, provide a, an overview of uh, how our uh, activities in the field of packet optical uh, white boxes. So here the key idea is that uh, uh, in the last years we have seen uh, uh, extremely relevant evolution of the pluggable technologies. So we moved from transponders that were very large uh, to, to uh, solutions that are nowadays uh, pluggable modules. You can you can then plug these modules in a still in a transponder box. We can we can now host many of these uh, pluggables, but you can also think about these uh, pluggable modules, coherent pluggable modules, to be placed in a packet switch uh, box like an Ethernet switch. Nowadays, uh, most of the the, the, more, the, the the most relevant uh, coherent uh, modules are still in th this uh, form factor, which is a little bit, say, large. So you, you cannot really find this, this DCO or ACO module. You cannot really find in a traditional Ethernet switch, the one that are used in the data center. But they are evolving quite fast. And, uh, and uh, this smaller form factor uh, that are uh, emerging will enable to place these coherent modules, uh, subject that there are drivers uh, properly written, in the traditional Ethernet switches that are uh, implemented in data centers. So this would open, will open really a, a new level of disaggregation because it will be very convenient to have an Ethernet box which has a very low cost thanks to disaggregation in the, in the computing world, in the networking world at the packet level. Uh, and also there is a very interesting evolution here because there is no, not just uh, say this point-to-point -point connection, uh, but also point-to-multipoint connection like the XR optics by Infinera, which is a point-to-multipoint uh, uh, technology or the passive optical network solutions like from TBIT. So they are all pluggable technologies. We, we are seeing here the evolution to, to support 400 uh, gigabit per second, 800 gigabit per second are emerging. So we still have some issues in the power levels, in the power consumption here, but the technology is, is progressing. And so we expect that this will really um, lead the, 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 the market in the optical transmission in the next years. Uh, so the, the main uh, idea with pluggable, coherent pluggable modules is that uh, um, you will have to, you may avoid to have independent transponders here and have just uh, pluggable modules inside the road. So basically we are, uh, we are considering the removal or at least to limit the number of transponders as standalone elements. Uh, this enables savings, for example, in the CAPEX, because you don't need to purchase a box that is independent, which also needs to be, uh, to, to, which also consumes power, which occupies spaces in the central offices. Uh, it needs to be maintained, so some OPEX cost. And also having the pluggable inside an IP box uh, provides really a tight integration or potential tight integration between packet and optical networks. Uh, the typical use case uh, that is uh, driving this evolution is that uh, uh, is for inter data center communication. So here you see the, the switch that is that behaves as top of rack, uh, sorry, as, as the um, uh, spine in a leaf and spine uh, data center. But the same box if equipped with a pluggable module can serve for inter data center communication uh, to reach the other uh, spine of another data center. And so here you don't need a, a, a transponder, 
but the same box can behave as both the spine and the and gateway to the data to the other adjacent data center, which is maybe 100 kilometer or or 200 kilometer far. So this is the use case that is driving these packet optical boxes. Here you can see the picture of the Cassini that you also have in your lab. And uh, um, and uh, nowadays there are relatively limited boxes that support the. Uh, uh, DCOs because the form factor is a little bit larger, so you still need to have a box that are specifically done for these purposes. But with the evolution of the pluggables that will uh, be uh, smaller, and uh, as soon as it will be possible to rely on the large market uh, of data center uh, switches, this will be very easy then to, to have pluggable modules everywhere coherent pluggable modules. So what we are uh, looking forward is to have a packet optical box uh, which uh, supports pluggable modules uh, that are small, coherent, and support uh, uh, standard interfaces like open config and open roadmap for the uh, interconnection towards a, another data center or towards the metro network or up to the cloud, but also support the packet programmability. And in particular, we consider P4. So as of today, there is no, the, the, you, you cannot really find this box in the market. Either they support the Sonic for uh, and, and an open source uh, operating system with P4, but they don't look at the, at the coherent, the support of coherent modules, or if they do, they do not have packet programmability. So we are still in a, in a transition phase in which uh, uh, it's not really possible to uh, merge together all the advantage provided by the uh, telecommunication uh, uh, sector uh, related to the control of coherent modules and the computing sector for the uh, data center, for example, programmability. Uh, we <clears throat> we also would like to have uh, uh, an open operating system uh, as an underlying technology. Um, open network Linux could be a solution that is not extremely efficient. Um, and on top, we may need to have something that helps uh, uh, taking advantage of the uh, underlying packet switch network. For example, he, uh, Sonic is a, a mature operating system uh, used in production data center networks, but uh, uh, it's, it's for it was designed for data centers. Now we are uh, in in our goal. We would like to apply Sonic in a telecom uh, like infrastructure, uh, so being able to support. Uh, um, not just uh, traditional BGP for intra data center operations, but uh, support what is necessary for the telecom operators. Uh, Sonic has some advantage, the possibility to, it is well organized, well, uh, well designed, uh, very reliable, uh, and you can place on top containers in which you can uh, uh, run uh, the, the um, solutions that, that you need. So it's a very promising uh, technology also for the telecom market. Uh, however, uh, say there are still some gaps that need to be, to be filled because it was not really designed for uh, running in a telecom infrastructure. One of these gaps is the support of the drivers, the so-called the transponder uh, abstraction interfaces uh and that and and this requires the support of the, of the vendors uh and uh, so it's not say a fully mature uh scenario as of today uh yeah here is an example of the gaps so there is no native netconf support in sonic however uh since the technology supports a container you can place your container as we have we have done, we placed our software as a container and it worked perfectly. It was interfaced with the, um, with the internal uh, Redis database of Sonic and it worked very nicely. Uh, another limitation is that uh, uh, there is no full support of uh, drivers for the coherent modules, but there is work going on in, uh, in the Telecom Infra project or led by NTT that is uh, progressing, although say some additional effort by the uh, overall community would be would be great. 
And, and then a third point, a third gap that I'd like to, to mention here uh, is the, uh, and I'd like to focus here, is the coordination between the packet and optical parameters. Uh, because uh, in principle, having pluggable modules enable uh, the tight integration between packet and optical layer. But this is not so easy to be actually achieved. So let me explain the, the issue here. So traditionally, you have a packet optical uh, network. Suppose that you have uh, these uh, node, packet optical nodes uh, that are at the edges, and you want to communicate with, for example, a cloud uh, infrastructure passing through a metro network. So in this context, uh, with the Rodums, for example. So in this context, you typically have one SDN controller that is in charge of the optical network controlling the rodents, and typically also in charge of the transponders here. And then you have a packet controller that is in charge of the packet network, the, the Ethernet switches, the IP switches. But once you don't have any more the transponders and you have transceivers that are within this box, uh, the issue is that the configuration of this transceiver should be done taking into account the transmission performance, meaning you need to configure the modulation format, the forward error correction, so the wavelength, many parameters that need to be defined by the optical controller, which is aware of the impairment uh, and, and of the network resources in the optical domain. But, but, but uh, the optical controller doesn't have access to this box. And at the same time, the, the, the packet controller, which has access to this box, doesn't know how to configure efficiently modulation formats or, or wavelength because he's not aware of the optical resources. So how to address these issues? There are basically two solutions. One is to enable our coordinated control of the box from two different trans uh, controllers here. So both can access the node and provide the configuration. And the other option is that they uh, mm, and this, this on the left does not require direct cooperation between the two controller for the coordination of the of this box, the pluggable modules. Instead, here you need you may need to have a, a communication between the two controllers passing, for example, through a parent SDN controller. So we investigated bo both options. Uh, here, uh, this was a uh, work presented at, at OFC early this year in which we investigated to, together with Telecom Italia. We investigated this, this solution in which uh, uh, we relied on a standard way, uh, on, on a standardized solution called NCACM, um, which basically provide reading and writing rights. The idea is very simple. So you define basically two users, uh, super users, so optical and packet. And so you, you enable the packet domain in the, in the control of the box, uh, of the op packet optical white box, uh, to have full rights to operate on IP technologies, like, for example, VLANs, anything related to the packet and optical technologies, everything is permitted. But then when it comes to the configuration of the optical parameters here in this example, it refers to open config, uh, everything related to the control of the terminal device or the optical components, uh, this has only uh, reading rights. And so create, update, and delete is denied. Vice versa, for the optical controller that connects to the box, uh, everything is denied for what concerns the IP uh, technologies and uh, while everything is permitted for the configuration of the optical parameters. So this worked uh, very nice. However, as soon as we started considering some workflow, we noticed that uh, it's not that easy, the coordination. So for example, suppose a soft failure here, consider that uh, we have a light path that is installed between this packet optical box passing through an optical network and is using port two. And then here there is some degradation, some uh, um, problem, uh, in, in the network. Maybe something that is not uh, an hard failure, something that is soft, that induces a minor degradation. Uh, so the, the, 
these, uh, these the minor degradation is detected. And now both controller need to be notified. However, if we, for example, enable the SDN controller, so they, they need now to, to, to operate in a coordinated way because if the restoration is uh, applied at both, uh, by both the controllers, we may have uh, uncoordinated restoration here. So in our case, we decided that first the SDN controller will take the lead and, for example, activate an alternative route passing through an existing alternative light path that sooner or later will reach the destination. Uh, so the SDN controller in the meantime can uh, try to localize the source of the failure, but it doesn't uh, operate on the light path. And this is typically because uh, it, 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 any adaptation, for example, of the modulation format or any parameter change here is uh, disruptive, so it's not heatless. So as soon as uh, instead the packet controller has moved the traffic away from this uh, purple light path and it moves to the red light path, the traffic can now the, is, is safely following a different route so the optical controller can be informed here that the restoration can be applied so he will make some changes in the network which may even induce some direct configuration in the packet optic changing for example some parameters here at this stage we have to the packet node informs the sdn controller that the light path is successfully restored and so possibly uh, the the um, the traffic is moved back to the original uh, light. So as you can see here, the workflow is quite complex and uh, and assumes that, for example, there is another light. But so uh, all this type of coordination requires a set of finite state machine and control, which is not so trivial. So the coordination between the two layers. Uh, we have implemented it in, in Sonic using, uh, with, uh, using a NetConf agent. Uh, at the moment, we don't have here in our lab uh, a packet optical box, so we are using an external module. Uh, that, however, is controlled as being a pluggable, so not configured by the SDN controller, but configured by the agent that is in charge of, of the packet optical box. Um, we then investigated the alternative solution in the here uh, month I, I presented to Hecock and it was uh, uh, relying on a parent SDN controller. Uh, so basically what is the idea is that first the uh, SDN, the parent SDN controller need to, to be aware of all the topology information referring to the packet network and the uh, optical network information and in addition it has to receive also the static connection information between the connection between the port in the packet box and the, the add port or the drop port in the road once it has this full view uh, it can handle a, a connectivity request and also in this case we need coordination first the uh, connection is passed to the optical controller can compute uh, not from say assuming to be from transponder to, to or from pluggable to pluggable to transceiver to transceiver but configuring on only the rodents the optical line system and uh, it identifies the type of pluggable of course you need to be informed by the packet by the parent controller about which type of pluggables modules are installed in the box so which capabilities they have so this can be taken into account by this controller. So once the computation is performed, impairment aware, the configuration is passed, the, 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 the light path is established from the add to the drop port, and the parent is returned with the specific configuration that needs to be installed in the packet controller by the packet controller to, to, related to the pluggable modules. And at this stage, the parent applies this, passes this information to the packet controller, which is the only one that is in charge of the configuration of the packet optical boxes. And only at this point, the um, uh, intent is uh, the the end-to-end -end path is successfully established. So as you can see, also in this case, there is the need for coordination, and we are just focusing on a single light path 
uh, not even considering in this case this of failure. Uh, and so we need also to take into account that we need to operate, for example, in case of failure to multiple LIPA. So the, the scalability here could be, and, and the efficiency here could be uh, an issue. Uh, also to show here, just to show that we have implemented this in, in the, um, with the, with the ONOS as a parent, uh, child packet and child uh, optical controller. So I'd like uh, now to spend uh, uh, the last uh, two, three minutes uh, uh, just highlighting the opportunities that uh, a packet optical box may have uh, in terms of uh, uh, programmability. So um, just to say that um, for those of you that are not familiar with the P4, P4 technology enables um, basically to have the ASIC uh, that handles the packet switching to be programmable. So there are an ingress pipeline, an egress pipeline that can be programmed to perform some changes, some configuration. And also very important, you have uh, memory there inside. So you can really have uh, stateful capabilities. And so, for example, consider each packet uh, not as an independent packet compared to the others, but uh, having a, 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 an history here and, uh, and taking advantage of, of these uh, um, capabilities. So you can have uh, interesting applications in terms of quality of service, uh, monitoring of the uh, latency information. Um, you can have a cybersecurity embedded in the network. Just to give you a couple of examples, inbound telemetry. Inbound telemetry is the possibility to uh, augment the packets that are flowing through the network with an extra header. This extra header can, for example, store the information, collected information of the time spent in queue by each, within each traversed packet packet node. And so end-to-end, -end, you can really measure precisely the performance of this uh, uh, service. Um, and and uh, for example, here, we even extended the use of the inbound telemetry up to the user equipment. And so we were really able to monitor end-to-end -end the performance from uh, uh, the, the user equipment up to the edge or up to the cloud. Uh, and, uh, and the last thing is that we can also uh, leverage on security. For example, um, if you consider a type of attack, which is the port scanning, which, uh, uh, or the denial of service attack, but with the port scan, you can uh, see packets that have a common uh, IP destination and they apply reconnaissance, meaning that they check uh, different uh, port uh, numbers. So if you treat each packet independently, you will never discover that there is this port scan attack in place. But if you are able to keep track of the latest packets that are targeting one uh, specific IP destination and you store the number of TCP ports, for example, that were considered, you may notice that at a certain point, uh, say there is some, this kind of attack. And the nice thing is that you can block this kind of attack uh, everywhere in the network. So you don't need to have just a firewall in, in front of the of the uh, data center, but all the nodes, all the packet optical nodes that are around in the network can be a sort of distributed firewall. Uh, of course, they will not have the same capabilities as a dedicated firewall, but at least they can serve to block most of the attacks. Like for example, DDoS attack can be blocked already in a distributed way, so to have a sort of distributed barrier. So this is just an example of the potential that a packet optical node can introduce in the network if it has programmability inside. So this concludes my, my talk. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. And if you have questions, just uh, also later on contact me. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Kujini. Um, uh, for uh, a wonderful, insightful uh, talk. Um, so I'll leave, uh, I'll open the floor now for question answers. Uh, the audience uh, uh, sitting in front, physical audience, if they have any question, you can go first. Would you like to ask something from Professor Kujini? And the virtual audience, you can either unmute yourself and just ask or write in the chat box.
Okay, so I, I, I do have a couple of questions, uh, Professor, if uh, you allow me. So, um, uh, first of, first one is a, a very opinion oriented question um, because it, 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 in fact, it, uh, uh, it was, um, it, it came into my mind during our last uh, uh, meeting, group meeting. <laughs> uh, why, in your opinion, is that, you know, P4 is going to replace open flow? So, I mean, what are the advantages or, you know, what are the things that, uh, that is uh, making P4 language a very, uh, you know, very, uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, coming out on top as compared to open flow since it has been, uh, I mean, as a, as a teacher teaching networking courses, uh, someone who is discussing open flow so much. Uh, so what, what added uh, benefits P4 brings to the table? If you can just comment on that. Yeah, um, first there are practical uh, things. That is, uh, OpenFlow has been almost, I would say, abandoned by the vendors. So it's not going to be uh, developed anymore. Um, the inventors abandoned as well and move from OpenFlow to P4. Uh, so in the next generation uh, devices, you will see uh, P4 and you will not see OpenFlow anymore like for example, the Intel uh, switches or the Mellanox switches, uh, they are moving to uh, P4 technology and, uh, and Barefoot is, is sorry, and, uh, and um, Broadcom is using a different technology as well. So, um, and the, so, so from a practical perspective, the, the future of OpenFlow is not really <laughs> uh, nice. Uh, but in, in terms of programmability, the, the, there are several advantages. The main thing is that you have memory inside, so you can, uh, you, you have much more um, uh, capability to program the network. You have stateful uh, capabilities. You can uh, uh, store uh, information, um, and uh, the availability of this technology at wire speed, uh, like with the Intel Tofino, uh, makes P4 uh, much more powerful. So you basically have much more options, much more things that you can do with P4 rather than uh, just uh, operating at the level of flow entries. So this is a really a real programming language similar to C uh, that operates on the packet, not just uh, simple operations that can be done using uh, flow, uh, flow tables, basically. Okay, perfect. Thank you. And just uh, another, uh, you know, uh, byproduct of this uh, question uh, that uh, for, the, for the students sitting here uh, listening to your talk, uh, is there any simulator available for the academic world where they can, you know, just... Uh, uh, try to run small experiments uh, uh, with the with the P4 language. Um, we had uh, we we used to use several simulators, but uh, nowadays I have to say that with the um, the availability of uh, Docker containers and open source solution is much more interesting and efficient to try to emulate a network rather than simulate. Yeah. For example, now in, in, in a European project, uh, uh, we are targeting to have uh, 1000 instances of Rodems and uh, uh, with uh, uh, that will run in some servers and they will communicate using the real netconf implementation and and we will have to control this network with a multi domain controller so um the level of um, uh, emulation that you can nowadays achieve thanks to these uh, these docker solutions is uh, much more powerful and much more close to reality than simulators that necessarily have simplifications there. So it depends, always depends on the, on the goal. Uh, but uh, my, uh, what we are following here is uh, more and more to emulate the network in, in this way, emulating the hardware, but having the real software uh, elements running. And uh, we use a simulator uh quite rarely nowadays now I, I, we still have our own simulator we, they were built in in the year so we don't uh, use really external uh, simulator excluding vpi for example but um, yeah my suggestion is 
mainly to move towards a scenario in which you emulate the network using real uh, open source modules, agent modules as Docker container, for example. Perfect. So that, that's a real confidence booster, your answer, because uh, we have a, a talk planned uh, on, uh, you know, the uh, open networking using Dockers and containers, uh, in, in, it, even uh, the, the last talk of today, uh, day three. So good. Uh, that, that's good. Uh, so thank you very much, Professor. Uh, if there anyone else had, uh, you know, any question jumped into someone's mind in the meantime? Yes. Okay, sure. Yes, uh, I, I do have a uh, high flip -off. Uh, hi morning I, I, I have a question just uh, from because there are also people from operators perspective so i just wanted to uh, know how do you compare the two stn uh, packet optical stn control approaches the distributed and the parent stn one in terms of uh, restoration time you know if you consider the soft failure yeah, um, this is a, a, a very good uh, good question, the comparison between the two. Uh, we are still discussing it with, uh, with Telecom Italia, for example. This is a, a hot discussion uh, ongoing in the Open Rodom community. Uh, because there are also other things that need to be taken into account. In terms of restoration, mm -hmm. Um, we, we, we need to check maybe with the nice uh, finite state machine installed in the, in the boxes, they could be equivalent. Uh, okay. But there are also other aspects that, are, that need to be taken into account. For example, simply just the maintenance, for example. Suppose that you need to update the operating system of uh, uh, the version of the operating system of the box. If you just uh, are, uh, have a connection with a single controller, this is very easy. If there are two different controllers, maybe provided by different vendors, it's say always something that uh, uh, makes this operation less, uh, say, relaxed. Uh, so th there are issues, that the, uh, and you may also, uh, in, in a real network, you may have different versions that are in place at the same time. So if you have different version of the node with the different controllers, controlled by different controllers, which have to manage different versions. So it starts to be complicated. So there are also maintenance and management issues that need to be considered. Um, as, as of today, uh, the, the most uh, uh, followed approach seems to be the one of the parent controller because also has a, a better, let's say, scalability. And particularly if the parent controller is of the same vendor of the for example, is, sorry, the parent is from the same vendor of the packet controller, there may be better coordination here. So this second solution seemed to be the most interesting one, uh, considered one, but it's still very open. Okay, thank you. Okay, so uh, one final question is it's from our audience sitting here. Yes. Uh, it's uh, regarding that full disaggregation. Now, in the case of full disaggregation, there will be multiple uh, parties involved. Yeah. So how in this scenario, how they will uh, implement the uh, service uh, agreement, the SLAs, and uh, in the case of complaints, how they are going to solve it? Okay, so uh, Dr. Abdul Latif sitting in the audience. Uh, Professor, you were able to hear the question completely? Uh, is in, uh, related to the full disaggregation, the responsibility, if there is an issue, is something like that? Is, yes, yes. I... yes. Okay, so okay, yeah. Have... Uh, this is a very good point. Um, the idea that it &T has is that uh, all the elements need to operate in a standard way. So for example, no uh, vendor proprietary solution, uh, only very standard uh, solution that needs to be controlled in a very standard way. And uh, so since everything is standardized in extreme detail, they expect a controller to operate in a uh, relatively safe uh, uh, way. Um, so, for example, uh, even the, 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 the detailed configuration at the hardware level, the uh, multi source agreement is, is standardized and validated. So, when they install the component, they expect everything to be operated uh, safely. So um, they will take the response, the, the controller will have the responsibility. Actually, at and is building their own SDN controller or they're relying on, a, on, a, on maybe a collaboration with, with a vendor uh, in which they are carefully testing everything. 
but yes, this is this is a risk. The other thing is that uh, it, it, since you need to standardize everything in extreme detail, uh, you adopt uh, uh, new technologies, uh, say slowly. For example, the, nowadays they are emerging the 800. Sooner they will emerge the 800 uh, transceiver. Uh, before adopting them. Uh, you will need to fully standardize everything to have more than one vendor to support them because you are in a full disaggregation. If you are in, an in a partial disaggregation, as soon as one vendor makes them available, you can purchase a couple of them and install them uh, and, and use them from day one. So uh, full disaggregation uh, is, is for a, a scenario which is maybe less challenging, less... Uh, uh, critical uh, with a lot of margin to operate the network safely um, and, but at the moment is not say for, for several reasons including this one is, is not say taken full, full uh, support okay um, so um, there, is a, there is a not from Dr. Abdulati so you have answered his question <laughs> Uh, so, if there are no further questions from the physical or the virtual audience, I think we can uh, go ahead and uh, thanks, uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Filippo Cugini. Thank you so much uh, for, for this invited talk. It was wonderful uh, to have you with us. And thanks a lot for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Thank you. Right, so this uh, wraps up our morning uh, session of day three uh, in the ASDON training. Uh, so I think we can have uh, a lunch break now. Um, so uh, uh, we can we are going to have a, a approximately fifty five minutes lunch break, and then we'll start at two. Today we'll start. We'll be able to start right on time at two. Uh, we have a session uh, from uh, Dr. Andrea of School of Superior Santana Pisa. And uh, after that, uh, um, uh, we, we have a, our last session by Abdullah Feather on uh, the benefits of uh, using dockers and containers uh, in open networking. So thank you so much. I'll uh, see, uh, let's reconvene at two Pakistan standard time. Okay, thank you.